Welcome to your mom. Your mom podcast. Your mom's podcast. This isn't any podcast. This is your mother's podcast. My mom's podcast. Nah, dude, she's your mom. With Ashley Allison and Lisa McCaffrey. Your mom is a podcast. Shut up, dude. Welcome back to your mom, Ashley Adamson, Lisa McCaffrey, back with you. And Lisa, I've said it, I don't know how many times, both on this podcast and to you, the gift of doing this thing, other than obviously getting to hang out with you every week, has been like the amazing people that we've been able to meet, not only through the interviews with these moms, like that goes without saying, but the untold part of that probably are the people that we've gotten to meet behind the scenes that we've been able to connect to. And today's episode and today's interview is the perfect example of that. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, this woman got <laughs> yes. me through our You don't need Super to say Bowl anything week. more than that. Pain <laughs> free. That's it. <laughs> and if you watch any of those episodes, Super Bowl week, you'll know I was pain free because of this woman that Amen we are about to, to that. bring that's on. The, and I'm so excited. Perfect yes. introduction. Yes. <laughs> and now she's your getting marriage, through my day to day. Motherhood, run, all of it. Life, my marriage, my parenting. <laughs> All of it. Yes. I attribute basically oh, Heather Vanderberg and to her. is her name. Heather. She's a mom to two <laughs> teenage girls. She lives in LA. She has a master's in international policy studies from Stanford. So she's smart like you, Lisa. Um, and she's had a really wildly successful career. Oh, her, her resume is amazing. She spent over 20 years in the luxury retail branding and marketing space. She was with Louis Vuitton, Tommy Hilfiger, Westfield. And today she leads the company near and dear to our hearts, who you referenced. She is the CEO of Flex Power the very first company who actually believed in us and sponsored this podcast to go to the Super Bowl. So if you've watched any of our content, as Lisa referenced, um, you know how much we love everything about this brand, this product, and the people behind it. So we'll get to all of that in a minute. But before I ramble any further, let's welcome in the one and only Heather Vandenberg, who is CEO of FlexPower, our favorite, favorite company in the world. And I've got all Products here, Heather. I got them all. <laughs> Thanks. That is the best, <laughs> best welcome ever. Thank you. It's so good to meet you guys. Close. I mean, listen to be to be working in a place where our mission is to just help people feel better every day. I don't know about you, but in the middle of COVID, we were working on our like our branding or whatever, and and it came up. You know, what's our mission statement? I was like, I don't know about you, but I just want to wake up and feel good every day. Like mm -hmm. I, it's Perfect. really that simple, right? And so. Why don't we just make that our mission? And that's kind of our North Star as a company. And and frankly, it's kind of been mine as a human being, right? It's just like, I just, what's going to make me feel good? What's going to help my kids feel good? What do I need to do to like raise good human beings, you know? And, um, and you know, that sort of guided me. And I had this very unusual career path that brought me to here, but, but I'm happy to be here. And I was so happy to meet you guys. And we moms got to stick together. So we were really excited to be um, Amen. among your first Our supporters. very first supporter. And I think you, you talk about yeah. moms sticking together and all the things that are required to be able to raise good humans, which is, you know, the, at the heart of what this podcast is all about and how you kind of get through it and help them grow. But you mentioned your career journey. So let's start with that to give people sort of high level understanding. I read a great story about you the other day that you kind of launched your career. BB is a brand that I love and you basically did not take no for an answer. So can can we start with that as sort of how you got into this space? Yeah, yeah I just chased it. I mean, I, you know, my whole life, I'm, I'm, that, I'm that generation of latchkey kids. So like I came home from school by myself. I made my own breakfast and lunch in the morning. I got myself to school. And and I feel like those of us who were latchkey kids, well, there's no gray area. We were like do-gooder rule followers who like chased our dreams, or we were like goofballs who like <laughs> broke every rule because there were no parents around, right? And I'm a, I'm a total rule follower. Um, and so I just kind of chased everything, you know, I chased, I wanted to go to Stanford for college. And I had a headmaster who was like, if you you'll never get in unless you're a black girl you'll never get in which was so offensive by the way wow. um and i didn't go there i went to uc santa barbara and then i was like who the heck is he i could i bet i could get in and i went and got a master's there and i went and um i went back to my old high school I love to that. show him my diploma and be like wow, wow, of course he's been fired so yeah um, thank goodness but, um so he didn't ruin any other kids <laughs> dreams but yeah. but this idea of like you see it i've always thought if i can picture it 
I can chase it and I can get it. And I, and I think that's from growing up so independent is being like, I got to figure stuff out. Like I want, I want food. I should figure out what meal I want to make. And I want this and I'm going to figure out how to get it. And so for BB, the way it worked out is I had come out of Stanford. I was engaged at the time. My husband was, um, working in tech and everyone was like, go to work in tech, work in tech. I worked at high tech PR for like a year and I was miserable. And the lesson there is you really have to love the product or the company that you're working for. Right. And that's what I tell my kids. I have a 19 year old who's looking at internships and I'm like, pick the mm -hmm. one where you're doing stuff you're going to love or where you love the person you're working for. I knew I was working on Motorola semiconductors. Like this is not for me. Um, and I, I left that job and I was like, what am I going to do? And I started roaming around Stanford Shopping Center, just idling my time, being like, what should I do? What should I do? And I kept shopping in this store called BB. And this is like 1995. And they had, I don't know, 20 stores or something, mostly around the Bay Area in California. And I was like, I heard they were based in San Francisco. I was like, well, I could work. I don't know why I couldn't work there. Like, I'm going to, I just want to work there. And I got a hold of the CEO's phone number. I had a friend who had interviewed and he had given her the number and I called every single day until he answered the phone. So I hung up on his assistant. I hung up on his voicemail. I, I hung up and I was, it was total old school because we didn't have, you know, there's no caller ID. Yeah. Like it wasn't right. you could today. DM right? someone or text them. Yeah. yeah. You could do that stuff and get away with it. Anyways, I did that for about a week and finally answered the phone. And I said, you know, I'm, I noticed you don't do a lot of marketing and I'm a communication consultant and I think you should hire me. And, um, and he was like, no, no, like I'm fine. And I said, well, you know, here's what I'm thinking. I'm gonna do a plan for you. I would normally charge $10,000, but I'm just made that free. up. I had no idea. I had no idea what people would do. I had no yeah. idea what I was doing. I totally made it up, yeah. but I'm gonna do it for free. And if you like the plan, you agree to meet me. And he's like, I'm on my way to Europe for three weeks and you know, sure. Send me a plan. So I went to the Stanford library and I spent two weeks working on this plan is the great to this wow. day. It is probably the best thing I've ever written. How do you admire a green library? It was, oh, this was the old, old, old library. It was the like business Fine. school where you had to use little Lexus Nexus. Like yes. it was hard school, hardcore. Like well, we didn't use it for that. We would go in the stacks because it was always <laughs> so vacant and we'd make out in there with <laughs> my version of the library. Way more fun there than I. But am. they they're all defunct now. They they knocked a couple of them down. They knocked Myers down. Go. It's on the internet. It's like so. Other than makeout location, right. like what are you doing in a library? Who needs um, well, other than making out? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, I wrote this plan, and honestly, you guys, it was pretty freaking brilliant. Like I'm pretty proud of this plan that I wrote. I, was I love like it. 25. I sent it to him and then I waited three weeks and then I called every day and I hung up on his <laughs> assistant and I hung up on every and he answers. And he was like, this is so weird. I never answer my phone. <laughs> like, and every time I do, it's you. And I was like, this is a sign that you need to meet me. <laughs> and so he met me, he read the plan and he hired me on the spot. And he gave, no way. he gave me three months. He's like, I'll give you a $10,000 budget to do whatever you can do. And he gave me three months. And in those three months, I just had this, I had this gut feeling. This is kind of how I've, my whole career has gone is like on gut feeling, like what's coming next. And everyone was obsessed back then with the red carpet of the Oscars, mm -hmm. but no one was talking about television. And I was like, I just think TV is the next thing. And so I flew to LA. I took the $10,000. I had a flight to LA. I cold called the um, costume designers for a couple of shows, Allie McBeal, which hadn't aired yet. Oh Friends, God. which had just started airing. It had been out for like a year or two. And uh, Brooke Shields show, Suddenly Susan. And I met with those um, costume designers and I was like, how do you do your job? What it, What is it that you need to do your job? And what they told me was, well, um, except for the woman from Friends, she had it dialed. Everyone else was like, you know, I have to go to these stores. I use my personal credit card. I take the clothes out. Then I have two weeks to return them and it's on my card. And if the fittings aren't done, I'm on the hook for the money. And it's such a hassle. And I'm like, what if I give you the clothes for free? What if I give them to you on consignment? I had no authority, by the way. I don't know. I made this up, but I was like, what if I give it to you on consignment? And then whatever you keep, you get 40% off. And she was like, are you kidding? That'll stretch my budget so far. I was like, sure, let's do it. Anyway, so Ally McBeal premieres. Oh, yeah. And if you guys remember that show at all, uh -huh. all short suits, people were oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. by how short the suits, the skirts were. We <laughs> but she had, had the legs to get away with it. That's right? for sure. And yeah. We had this skirt called the Get right. Shorty where we were going to be sued by the film. Um, no. 
it was crazy. So in those three months, I got us on these shows and then people magazines writing about anyways. So Manny was like, oh. okay, now I'm going to make you my head of marketing. And that's wow. why I became a head of marketing. Is wow. Talking okay. my way did into did you always like, there is such an innate level of confidence that I think you have to have in order to yes. be able to call someone that many times to just be like, I know I can do this and figure it out, fly to LA, figure yeah. it out. What, did you always have that yeah. growing up? Like, how did you, that's amazing to me. No, I did not have it growing up. Growing up, I was, when I say I was mm. alone a lot, I was alone a lot. Yeah. And, um, and so because your parents were working, I assume, right? Yeah, and they they had issues that we just won't get into, but okay. they just like weren't around. Everybody's um, here. But 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 they put sent me to an excellent school and they, you know, they made sure I had everything I needed, right? And right. so I think my confidence came because I never mm. had anyone tell me I couldn't do something. So I did have those parents who were like, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. I did have, um, my dad was always like, you're really smart. Like you're smarter than other people. And he, you know, and he would, he would say that, but I didn't have anyone like the way my 19 year old is now, I have to say she's at Stanford. My boyfriend's like, you know, you have to tell everyone she's at Stanford. I didn't even I know like, she was no, at Stanford. I That's I amazing. really do. I'm so I, 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 and I'm so flipping proud of her, but yeah. she'll call me like, so which internship should I apply for? Could you proofread this thing for me? Whatever. And I'm happy yeah. to do it. But I didn't have that, right? So I had this confidence that was based on no reality whatsoever <laughs> because no yeah. one had looked at anything I had done. No one had told me I could do it. No one told me I couldn't. And I'm a class half full person. So I'm like, unless someone's telling me I can't do it, why wouldn't I just do it? And so, and you know, every time I did something like that, yeah it was successful. Like every time I chased something, whether I got the exact thing I wanted or not, it got me a step further in this path of who I wanted to grow up to be. And, um, and so I, j it kind of started with false confidence. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was like fake confidence and then it got me there. And so once I had the job with Manny, I was like, well, I just cold called a CEO and got this job. So why can't I cold call a costume designer or, or cold call a fashion editor? and tell them they had to put us in their magazines, you know? I mean, the head of hers, Jeanette Chang at the time, we became friends because she was like, <laughs> the audacity you had, you called me and was like, I expect to be in Harper's Bazaar magazine. She's like, you were a BB, like, I can't believe. And sure enough, we ended up in Harper's Bazaar magazine, you know? No and it was just, it was totally a fake confidence, but it's that. No, there's nothing fake about that confidence. That's confidence. That is the <laughs> fake about it. I'm telling you, that is complete. But you know, confidence. as a mom, like kids, yeah, I see kids and their parents are like, tuck your shirt in, or this doesn't look right. Or, you know, you did this wrong or whatever. I didn't have that. And I, mm -hmm. but I also didn't have the other. Right. And so it's kind of like who you are and how you forge your life. But I, I've tried to raise kids who are extremely confident and the way they argue with me and challenge me, <laughs> I, I feel like I've succeeded. You're like, okay, maybe <laughs> dial it back a little bit. Like we're less confident right now. I, yeah, yeah, I think there's a whole thing, especially yeah. with young women and confidence. And it's something that, and I've, I've talked about this a lot too, but I, I struggled with it and the imposter syndrome early in my career. And there's been a lot of studies around it yes. and it is different biologically. Men have confidence in that they are more confident than women, just inherently, biologically, that is how we are wired. Whether they're capable or not. Well, that's the whole, the study is amazing. I should, I'll link it in these notes. The study, yeah. I send it to every young woman who I talk to that wow. is trying to get yeah. into this business because I say, this is the thing that will probably hold you back the most. Because I hear it when I talk to them. Like, I don't Where know Where were I, you when I was yes. 20? Because I had yeah. zero confidence at all. You and Heather. Out in the library. I, I was yeah. in the library making out. Great. That's a lot of good that did. <laughs> you think that would have helped? No. <laughs> no, it, it is. I think there's a huge thing to it. And part of it is to do a full circle bow on, on BB and, and confidence. The first ever suit that I owned was from BB. And I remember it was when I got my first, yeah, when I went around and got my first, um, my very first on-air job was in Syracuse, New York. And my stepmom had actually taken me shopping to buy me because I didn't have, I mean, I had like no clothes because I was broke and had nothing. Yeah. She was like, I think you need a nice something to wear. And we went to BB and I got this black, like thin pinstripe suit. Love it. And great. I wore it, it every day. I mean, I think I wore that thing yeah. 
like it had holes in it after the <laughs> seven years that I wore in local news. So we did a whole I program for doing. newscasters and for on-air talent because they always had to wear bright right. colors. So every time right. I came out with a new color, I'd send it like to the girls in entertainment tonight oh. and all the people who needed to wear, you know, colors on air. It was a whole program. That I could have I used. Where you were you when I was in? I know I was going to say, where were you? Because I'm wearing like mock black turtlenecks because I could wear them over and over again. Like I, I did not have that look. Oh, that's yeah, that's fascinating. And I love that your daughter is at Stanford. That that must have been a cool moment when you found out that she got in. It it was a cool moment until she came. I was telling Lisa the story until she came home and she was. I'm like, let's go celebrate. She's like. I will, I will have dinner with you, but I will not celebrate. I'm not sure I want to go. And I just almost yeah. throttled her <laughs> for, for like yeah, three I months. She put me through the like, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll go to you. Uh. And I was like, I'm going to freaking. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I realized that she had to kind of break up with me. Like we're so, so close. And she had to do this thing where like, I'm going to make an independent decision, even if it makes you insane. And luckily, <laughs> like, she made crazy. decision. But um, I, I would have, we, we had a whole game plan on how we were going to like force her to go, even <laughs> bribe her, whatever it takes. It's so wrong. It was, it was, it was not a shining mom moment. Like the, my emotions during those three months. But anyways, I'm, I'm super proud of her now. She's a great kid. That's fantastic. And she's on a billboard. And yeah, she's on a billboard. I saw her. I was literally driving in LA and I yeah. see her. I took a picture and sent it to you. She's, first of all, she's beautiful too. I know you uh, probably never say yeah. that, but oh my gosh, I'm like, wow, she's gorgeous. So she, she uh, she's on a billboard like for Stanford? No, for no, Flex Power. Flex power. Because we, Flex power. we launched yeah. Flex Power when I, eventually, when I eventually joined and then we were ready to relaunch. We launched in the middle of COVID, um, and, which was an impossible time to market. And it was into- impossible to shoot a campaign of any kind. You couldn't hire models, photographers. No one would do it. We found a photographer who shot all outdoor with only natural light. And so I made my daughter and her boyfriend model for us. And then we're shooting our founder, who's this incredibly good looking uh, black man. He also, he's in every single campaign. Yes. I've um, seen him too. Yeah, yeah. So we made them, yeah. we, we use them as our models. And then the photographer and the creative director are like, oh my God, she's a natural. So she's gotten to stay in the campaign all three years. So has her price, uh, like, is she charging you more? <laughs> I literally you know? $16 an hour as an intern. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, wow. We, we got, got a business talk. mind that we need. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. oh, and she gets cool. to like tell her friend she's on a billboard. So I mean, like, that's pretty cool. Priceless. It's very cool. Well, good. Well, good. For, I'm glad she made, I'm glad she made the right choice. Whatever you did to help her navigate that, she ended up at a, an amazing place. And <laughs> all right. Well, that ends well. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to, and I, I do want to get to your, um, how you kind of came into Flex Power because it's a, it's an amazing story, but can we go back to, I, I think it was September of 2009. Yeah. And you were working in New York. Were you with? Yeah. Louis I was at Louis Vuitton. Vuitton. So, at, you know, the trajectory went, and again, ridiculous career path, right? I went from BB at four years. We took it public. We made, we wow. made, we were at 250 million in sales, took the company public successfully. I put them on the, the founders on the cover of Forbes magazine. And then I got recruited by LVMH. Um, and I should not have gotten that job. I was 30 years old. I was the youngest ever vice president heading marketing wow. communication there. Um, and so, and I held that job for 10 years. So I had my two mm-hmm. kids during that time. I got divorced during that time. We wow. quadrupled Louis Vuitton sales in my first four years and then doubled that number again in my next five. So oh we gosh. were on this, like, it was this crazy ride and a lot of work. And um, the people would be like, how do you do it? The work-life balance. And I feel like any mom who works gets this question. And I, I was like, I don't know, you just do it. Like I have to support my family and I have a career that I loved before I became a mom. So I don't yep. change as a person, but I did have to, you know, navigate that and making sure I was at every school thing and every doctor appointment and every, you know, and all of that. And then I got divorced in t- 2007 and my ex-husband moved away, um, like an hour away. He was living in Long Island and he didn't see, so I had the kids all the time. Um, and they were one and three when I got divorced. Oh, wow. And so two years later, they were three and five. And my three-year-old um, was about to start preschool, which is at the same school as her sister. And she was on her way to school in her first week. And she was on a scooter in a crosswalk and on a green light with her nanny. And she had pushed off from the curb. So her nanny was a little bit behind her. And a guy um, saw a parking place on the street that she was crossing it was on the wrong, it was a, you know, one way going the wrong way. So he reversed up York Avenue, reversed 
the wrong way down the one-way street and he ran her over in the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, <clears throat> this is where the work-life balance thing gets sticky. I was at the top of the LVMH tower and they just told us to turn our phones off for this executive meeting that we were having. And so I missed the call. And I've got to tell you, I will never miss another call. Like at, at, my phone is with me all the time. And I remember when I you know, met my boyfriend, I was like, it's not because I think I'm important or anything, but I will never again miss a phone call because that was the worst is we have a coffee break and I turn on my phone and there's like 20 messages. My phone's just yeah. blowing up and it's it, the nanny leaves a voicemail and she's like, there's been an accident. Something's happened to Elle. And then she fainted at the scene. So then her phone goes dead. I can't reach her. She had reached my ex-husband. I call him and he was like, oh, I heard, I talked to Elle. She was crying. I'm sure she's fine. I'll stay in Long Island. I was like, are you kidding me, right? And I was wearing like four and a half inch Christian Louboutin heels. <laughs> if you've ever worn those shoes, they are the most painful shoes on the planet. And I ran, I just ran. I just grabbed my purse. I left everything in the LVMH tower and I just ran to get a taxi. And I had a dear friend, John Slavinsky, who ran with me and we made it to the hospital. Um, and that started this like horrible journey of, of, well, how long was she in ICU? She was in ICU six months. And then she was, she had 10 brain surgeries. She was paralyzed at one point, moved to a rehab center up upstate um, for five more months. And then she eventually was able to walk out of there and come home. So she missed that, that entire year. And I took a leave of absence. I mean, I literally fled my job. Like, like I fled and I just didn't come back. And, you know, as a, as a manager, I had had this boss early on who said, you know, I should be able to be hit by a bus tomorrow and all of you can keep running this company. Like if mm -hmm. I've done my job managing everything, things should be able to work without me. And I kind of took that as my lesson, thankfully, because I was able to kind of abandon this giant job and I just disappeared. Like I didn't come back. And somewhere around the six month mark, they were like, oh, you, you have a lot of insurance bills. Like you really do need to come back. I had $3 million in insurance in oh. medical bills. And my insurance was fully covered. LVMH, God bless them, had great insurance. And so when she went into rehab, I did have to go back to work. And then I would leave at five, which was unheard of in New York at LVMH. Yeah. Um, and I would either take a train or a zip car and I would drive an hour up north to White Plains where she was um, staying. And I would spend the evening with her until she fell asleep and then come back to the city. Um, oh. So it was, it was oh. grueling. Yeah. How long did you have to do that for? That's I did that for like four months and her dad and I would take turns like on the weekends, we would take turns. Like one would take one day, one would take the other. She had a sister, her sister Leela was with us. And so one of us would get Leela, but then Leela started wanting to go be with her sister. So she would, Leela gave up. I mean, you know, when people are like, how did she get into Stanford? I was like, Leela herself has a pretty amazing story because yeah. you know, she gave up a year of her childhood wanting to take care of her sister. And when Elle was in a wheelchair and, and was learning to walk and everything, she was there like holding her hands, helping her learn how to walk. And, and so um, it was just, the whole thing just changed our entire family. And frankly, it helped all of us grow a lot. And it's really easy when you go through something so painful. And I know, Ashley, we talked about this because you have someone near and dear to you who's gone through something. And, and you have this moment where you're like, how am I going to respond to this thing we just went through? And you can crumble or you can rise to the occasion and, and be like, okay, well, this has happened. I can't sit around. I can wish that it didn't happen. I can think, what if it didn't happen? Or I could say like, this is the hand we've been dealt and, and how are we going to get through it? You know? And there was a time when Elle was in, um, rehab and she, I put her to bed and I always, I always wear some kind of necklace and she pulled me down by her, by my necklace. She's like, get me out of here. And I was like, like a jailbreak. And she was four. She has that same tenacity now. And I was like, I'm not getting you out of here. Someday you will walk and I will hold your hand and we will walk out of here. And she's like, I can't do it. And I'm like, you can do it. And like someday, and I was totally stoic. And then I'd get in the car and I'd cry all the way back to Manhattan. And I, and this went on for months. Um, and eventually, um, eventually I ended up having this law passed, which I guess we'll talk, we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, and, but the day I was coming back from Albany, the day I had had Elle's law submitted to Congress, um, Albany is, you know, her, her place, her Blythedale was on the way home. And so I stopped to see her and that day I walk into the physical therapy room and her therapist at the other end. And she was like, Heather, drop your bags, just drop your bags and just stand there. 
And L, she gave L. Remember, she's four years old. She gave her this tiny little cane, and she's like, "Walk to your mom." And L like took her little cane and like walked over to me, and I'm just bawling. I mean, I'm I'm all dressed up. I've just been in Albany trying to be like all powerful and change this law in New York that let the guy who hit her run free. And um, and that's the same day she walked to me, and I was like, "This is how I know I'm on the right path." Like everything, you know, in the right. Sending you a message for sure. Yeah. yeah. I do you think that happens in life? You know, yes. it's like everything breaks apart at the same time, it feels like. And I also feel like things all come together at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully said, Heather. How, how did you, and, and I do want to talk about the bill and how you did that, but how did you channel that pain? I imagine yeah. anger, a lot of anger um, and just despair. I mean, right. And, yeah. and stress and worrying. There's so it is, it is all consuming. How did it's all consuming that's how you channeled it? You know, I have to be honest, if I only had one child, it might have totally consumed me, but I had to be mm -hmm. strong because I had another daughter who lived with me. So I would, at, at 8 a.m., I would take Leela to school. I would walk to the hospital. I'd spend 12 hours with Elle, and then her father would come at 8 p.m., and he would do the night shift. And so I'd go home and take care of Leela. And so I always had to have that brave face for Leela. And sometimes, again, it's a little fake it till you make it, but sometimes the act of having to be brave you start to actually become brave, you know, yeah. when, when you have to hold it together for someone else. Um, and at the same time, I'm going back to this kind of confidence that I was like, things aren't right. I can change them or I want to do something. I can change it. I can fix it. Um, that kind of stuck with me. And so there was a time early on when, especially when Elle was in the coma for three weeks, and I just sat there and I would cry and I just pray to any God or anyone who would hear me. Like I, I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. I would stop in any church, any synagogue, any place I walked by, I would stop and like light a candle or say a prayer. And I had people all over the world, like friends who had talked to other people and people were saying prayers and sending me prayer candles. I had a bathtub just full of things people had sent me. Um, and, and I was like, this is like, it was so painful. And I, I, it was, physically painful, like what we were going through and watching her in this state. And I would go home at night and try to sleep. And I would have these nightmares about killing this man. And I don't have violent nightmares. And I was like, this has to stop. Like, this can't be where my energy is because I, it, it was so stressful, this hatred I had for this guy who had run over her. Um, and one day I was walking Leela to school and Elle was still, I think she was out of the coma at this point, but she was still in ICU. And, and I was walking her to school and we see this Ford Bronco idling at the stoplight. And that's the brand of car that had hit Elle. And she was hit by, um, by a man. And so the man in the Ford Bronco kind of matched the description in the police report I had seen. And I am walking and, and my hands start sweating. Like I'm kind of an open book. You can, you, I, you can read everything on my face. You, you see everything. And Leela, five years old, it's like, what's wrong? Is everything okay, mommy? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I just thought for a second that was the guy who had hit L. And she goes, oh, that's impossible. That guy would be in jail. And, and I lied to her and I was like, you're totally right. That guy's in jail because I couldn't bear for her to think that this horrible thing could happen to her sister and nothing happened to the guy yeah. because I had called the police department when I got the report and I was like, what do you mean you're not arresting him? Cause I'm from California where if you drive recklessly and you run over a pedestrian, you go to jail. Yeah. And it turns out New York had no laws to protect pedestrians. So the guy got a ticket for $138 oh. as mm -hmm. if he had like rolled a stop sign. And I was, I was like, what can I do? And he's like, I'm sorry, the law is the law. And so many people said that expression to me, the law is the law. They're like, you can take, you know, challenge it in civil court. You can take him to court and sue him. I'm like, this guy's a porter in a building. I could sue him for every penny he has, and it's not going to bring my daughter back. And it's not going to make a dent in the medical bills. I'm not going to do that. I just thought, you know, if ever I get my strength back, the minute I know Elle's going to survive and I can take my focus off the hospital and, and add something else to my plate, um, I'm going to change this bloody law. Because I was sick of people telling me the law is the law. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to figure out how to change it. And that's the kind of like the same confidence that allowed me to cold call the CEO BB when I was 25. But I was like, how hard can it be? Like, I'm going to change the law. And then and then we we did. <laughs> how? How did wow. like how, yeah, because I lived hard. in Albany. That was my very first job. I worked yeah. at a local news station in Albany. I covered New York politics. I got and you don't just 
get a law changed in the way, I mean, can, can you describe sort of just high level how so that it was happened? an era. So 2009, 2010 was an era where every, there was a lot of infighting, I guess New York always has a lot of infighting, but there was a lot of infighting and they were being criticized for not getting a lot done. Um, and so, and this was a really easy issue for everyone to get behind. Right. Yeah, so, I think everybody would be on board with that. For yeah. Sure. There's no politics around this issue. So first of all, I was in a, it was a good environment. Then I called my friend, Sean Cassidy, who's not the 70s pop star. He's actually the CEO <laughs> of a great company called um, DKC, and they're one of the top PR firms. And I was like, if I wanted to change a law, like, how would I do this? And he said, well, you know, we just bought a lobbying firm in Albany. So why don't I introduce you? And you know what? This is, again, this is why the Your Mom podcast works. It was a single mom who ran this agency. Nice. And he was like she is going to love your story and she is going to want to help you. And Once so I, again, divine intervention. Swear. Yeah. Again, it's like everything just kind of Jeez. worked. And doors open. Allison Lee, she was this amazing woman, um, herself a single mom, had raised a grown son. And, um, and I told her my story. She's like, I'm going to do this pro bono. So she's like, first, mm -hmm. we'll call your assemblyman in Manhattan because it happened in his district. He sponsored it, Micah Kellner. And then she said, you have to come to Albany and we're gonna just do some meet and greets. And I remember I'm following her up the stairs at the Capitol and she's wearing like, I mean, she looks like Annette Benning in um, in yeah. An American President, like perfect hair and she's all dressed perfectly. Her Manolos are like clicking as she's walking and she was like, let's go make some friends. And we like roll into yeah. the Capitol. In the room. We basically met a bunch of senators. Um, Senator DeLon from Brooklyn agreed to sponsor the bill in the Senate. And by the time I left that afternoon, our bill was already in motion and wow. it was only That's two awesome. months to get it through every committee. It was passed unanimously and it was signed by Governor Patterson. And when something passes unanimously, it's because it so obviously was needed. Right. Right. So and Elle was like, so did the guy end up going to jail? And I'm like, sorry, no, it didn't yeah. go backwards, but it does go forwards. And there is no jail time. It actually is just that you lose your license for six months, but it's better than nothing. And better than nothing. You know, yeah. and as much as there's controversy over whether or not Bill de Blasio was a good mayor or not, one thing he did embrace was pedestrian safety, right? And so he chased this topic really aggressively. And and I was so proud of, of being a part of all that. Wow. Yeah. And I can't believe it's named after your daughter. That's, after I know she daughter. doesn't appreciate it now, but that's really special. Yeah. It's called Elle's Law. And, and you know, right now she's 17. So she's like, I don't want everyone to know, you know, she's oh, in that, yeah. that phase. But, um, but she's like, I am pretty proud that you did that. So, and that was the other thing is I wanted to demonstrate to my daughter is like, okay, here we are in the face of something so horrible. So we could let horribleness keep happening to us, or we could try to do something good. And so all that hate energy and that like, and my nightmare stopped too, like all that bad energy that was coming from that. I was like, let me put it towards something else. And let me put it towards something good that maybe help will help other people in the future. And so and so that's what I did. And and I jumped off my career for a year to take care of Elle when she came out of the hospital. Um, and it was totally worth it. Like nothing's worth more than making sure your kids are healthy. You know? yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. And and how, two questions, and then I, I really want to talk about your journey and what you're doing now, but I would love to hear how Elle is doing now. She's 17 and I'm sure going through some of the high school things that everybody goes through. Probably. She's a 17 year old girl. So there's a lot of eye rolling. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of like this morning's argument was about um, there were bumps in her ponytail and I couldn't get the ponytail mm -hmm. right. So I'm a natural marketer. So instead I was like, honey, it's totally in to have like bumps in your ponytail. It's called a messy <laughs> ponytail for a reason. Like, don't you hear people talking about like a messy pony or a messy bun? Like, <laughs> and she did that's, that's the she best spin I've ever heard. It's true. Right? <laughs> You know, Heather, and I just think if if you could have flashed forward to, you know, from one of those horrible of all of the horrible nights that you spent in the hospital and all those days you spent yeah. by her bedside, if you could have imagined the smile on your face thinking about arguing over bumps in a ponytail when I she's know, 17 right? years old, right? Like what a gift that that's what the argument is exactly. now. Exactly, exactly. Um, what advice would you have for a parent who is going through or has been through a traumatic experience like that with a child? Like, what do you wish you had known? So, um, well, there's, you know, they, there's all these like, I don't know, there's kind of cliches about like it rains and then there's a rainbow and there, you know, there's all that. The mm -hmm. one thing my dad said to me when I was going through this and my dad knows this well, and this is an entirely other segment, but my brother had died in a car accident at 17 and he didn't die. He was in a coma for three years and then he died and he died on my 28th birthday. And my dad and my mom 
were traumatized through those three years, right? They spent three years in a hospital knowing he wasn't going to be back. And the technology that ended up saving Elle's life with her brain injury, had it been available 20 years earlier, probably could have saved his. So there's Mm. some irony. Oh my gosh. So when I'm going through this, my dad just kept saying, this too shall pass. And, And I was like, dad, seriously, you don't freaking get it. And he's like, I actually really do get it. Yeah. I really get it. And he's like, you just have, like, just keep going, like find the strength, get up, do what you need to do, be present, be there for your, you know, for your other daughter, you know, do what you have to do and just know that like this too shall pass. Like you will get through this. You will get through this. And, and you will like anyone going through something like that. I think the important thing is like, this is a moment in time and it's the most horrible moment in time, but I believe in feeling everything as it's happening. Like I, I'm not a big, I didn't carry a lot of stress with me after the accident and after we went through all that, because I'm like, I just want, like, I felt it in the moment and my sadness was in the moment and my anger was in the moment. And then as she got better, I was like, let's look to the what's ahead. Like, oh, and she took a, she walked with a cane and I was like, let's just think like the good thing. Let's not think about the bad thing that we just came. Yeah. Let's think about the good things that can be ahead. And sometimes we would have, a, she'd have a surgery and then there would be all these complications and we'd think she's checking out. And then sure enough, no, she's back in the hospital again. And, and I, there were moments where it was like, you know, Charlie Brown and Lucy in the football where you're like, oh my God, really? This, like it's never getting better, but everything does time heals everything. And it really does get better. And this too does pass. And I think the lesson for anyone going through it is this is a decision you have to make is how you're going to go through it. You can decide if it's going to, if it's going to like make you crumble or if it's going to make you rise. And, and that is, that is a decision that doesn't happen to you. There's a lot of people who play the victim game. You know, when my brother went through all that, my mom was very much a victim and my dad was like, let's get through this. Let's feel the pain and then let's move forward. Right. And and I tend to practice that. And I think it's, you know, especially when you have other children in the household, it's so important that you can do that. First of all, you need to write a book. I think about now your journey, and it seems like in some ways you've come full circle yeah. in now trying to help solve other people's pain. And this is the the physical pain, but yeah. also I think it's all connected, right? Like, oh, it's, it's all connected. I mean, you know, this is why I think the wellness category is exploding in America yeah. right now, because I think, especially coming out of COVID, people started prioritizing how do I feel over how do I look? Cause we got to be home and do zoom calls and turn our cameras mm-hmm. off or whatever. But, but this idea of taking care of yourself, um, you know, spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically, I think it's a big part of the dialogue for a reason because people really need this. And so, you know, healing comes in many ways, shapes and forms. And, and if, if physically you can heal yourself, with a product or, or whatever, physical therapy or Pilates or whatever it is you do. But if you can make your body feel good, that gives you the strength that to do good, right? It gives you the strength to like, if you get that call that something terrible has happened in your family, if you're hobbling around or your back hurts, like if I was in any kind of physical pain during those moments, I wouldn't have been able to run around the hospital and go to CAT scans and go to, and do all that stuff. Right. Cause I would have been. And so I think for ourselves, making sure that we start every day feeling good so that we can be our best selves is super important. I I, I mean, all you really do need to write a book for real. You You know, it's funny. I started when I took the year off, I started writing a book and my book agent was like, well, they want to publish it, but only if you can make it into a movie. So then I talked to this William Morris agent and they're like, Lifetime wants to do a story on you, but only if there's a book. And I was like, I have to go back to work, people. I I, yeah, enough and of so I, I have half of it written. And then I went back to, and but the part that's written is really all about Elle because I wanted to write it down before I forgot. Like I didn't Which write is, it. I'm so glad that you did that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't keep a journal or anything. I was too busy, but, um, and you but can I wrote go, it all down. And, and then go back back and pull from what happened with your brother and their, your parents and how they dealt with it. It's, this is fascinating. Gosh, what a like family study and on how to deal with, you know, these tragic events. I, I'm, I'm in awe. I cannot believe Aww. that that happened and that happened. You're yeah. very, very inspirational. My goodness. Wow. I'm impressed. Have you talked to your dad about his experience? I mean, obviously he was really helpful in it, but have you ever sat down and like almost kind of interviewed him about? He doesn't like to talk about it. He doesn't yeah. like to talk about my brother and what he went through and everything yeah. it's very much like I did this. I felt it. I grieved mm-hmm. and I moved forward. And, yeah. um, every once in a while he'll tell a story and he'll be like, I remember when, when Robbie did blah, blah, blah. And I'll see like a little tear in his eye. And he just oh. doesn't, he doesn't like to talk about it. He doesn't, 
um, he's not a super emotional guy, you know, even when he was like, you know, trying to give me words of wisdom and saying this too shall pass. It was not like a hand on the shoulder, like, yeah, like, let me have this moment. It was like, this too shall pass. Like, you, like you will get through this. Yeah. And, and, uh, you're, and what, and how, how is your mom dealing with it to this day? How so my she- mom, when my brother died, my mom crumbled, she crumbled. So this was 25 years ago. She never recovered. She never recovered. So she was depressed. She was like, she blamed everyone. She blamed my dad for buying him the car. She blamed, Ugh. like she blamed everyone. Um, and she was just, she became just miserable. And she basically gave up her own life in her misery. Like, you know, and that was a really powerful lesson for me is to do the opposite. Had I lost him, maybe I would take a different approach. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe it would be different because I have a happy ending, right? My daughter survived and, you know, she has a brain injury. She has learning issues. She has behavior issues. She can't use her right arm. There's a whole bunch of things, but she's here. Yeah. So it's hard to say, but I, but I do, I do think that it's kind of like you have that, you have a moment where you're like, I'm going to grieve. Like my dad grieved, like he, right. He felt like, it. Oh, he took it in. That probably helped him now. Yeah. He felt maybe got it out and, and felt it. Yeah. And then he was like, now I need to start living my life, you know? And then, and then, cause, cause what are you going to do? Give up your life? Like right. the person you loved wouldn't want you to give up your life. You know, they would want you to go on with your life. And so, um, but uh, you know, the, it, losing someone to an accident is so awful because you don't get to say goodbye. You yeah. know, so and, so and I just think that's, that's so tough because, you know, I always think like my last conversations, like when I get on a plane, I'm always like, I love you. Like I send it to both my girls. I could be flying just, I go back and forth to San Francisco. It could be that flight. And Leela's like, I'm in class. What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm on a plane. Love you. you know? <laughs> but I always want that to be like, yes, the last, right. just in yeah. case, you know, just in case. Yeah. I totally wow. get that. And, and, you know, it is, I think grief, people process it in, in every different way. And wow. It is, I think, one of the saddest outcomes of grief is when you you do lose. You, it's another life that is lost, yeah. maybe not physically, but yeah. but emotionally, certainly. I all right, Heather. Let's talk about your how you sort of the story of how you got involved with Flex Power and where you were and what you were going through <laughs> is really amazing. And I think also speaks to one of the issues, which is people who suffer chronic pain. Like seventy percent of them are women, and yet most of the studies are done on men. And it feels like there's this dismissal of how women feel pain, how they're treated yeah. for pain, all of that. So yeah. tell your story about how you kind of found Flex Power and, and where you were right when it all kind of happened. You it's know, um, to your point, there's a CDC study. If I can find it, I'll give it to you to put in this chat. Yeah. And it came out after COVID, so 2022. And they found that, um, so on any given day, 60% of Americans are walking around in pain. So you think about those numbers, like how many people, I don't, I never knew how many people were walking around in pain until I became the CEO of Flex Power and I tell someone what I do and they're like, oh, my back. And I'm like, oh, here's, I'm like Santa, like here's some Flex Power. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, of that number, then you take 20% of Americans have chronic pain, which means for six months or more and it doesn't go away. And this study looked at men and women and it looked at all different ages and it looked at um, household income, lower household incomes have a higher pain. They also are more likely to be doing physical labor, physical jobs. Um, and it's a really thorough study and it's fascinating and heartbreaking at the same time. Because when I first um, it found Flex Power in 2018, 2019, we had done some research on what was happening and we couldn't find numbers like this. And it was only after COVID that people were being very frank about their physical and their mental mm. well-being. And I think for all the bad things that came out of the pandemic, this is a good thing, I think, which is people feel free to talk about whether it's their mental health or their physical health and to talk about what's going on with them. Um, and I discovered Flex Power a year before COVID. So I had gone from uh, Louis Vuitton and I took that year off. I worked, I was at Tommy Hilfiger for a few years and then I really wanted to move home to LA. Coming out of that experience with Elle, I just thought my life has to change. Like it, it's up to me to change my life and it has to change. And I had a custody agreement with my ex-husband that I thought I would never be able to leave. My lawyer said, you have 27 things that have to happen. And it took me eight years and I did all 27 things. Wow. And the last one was, he called it the, the BFJ, the big effing job. It was so big that like I had to make the move. And my kids really wanted to move back to, wanted to move to LA. They visited their grandparents here and stuff. So we moved out here 
Um, and I become the CEO of Westfield, which owned all these great shopping center properties. So all my knowledge of retail and fashion and all was transferred into this new role. And my role is to create these experiences and, and kind of upgrade the Westfield experience, which we did so well that the company sold for, I think, $25 billion or some crazy number uh, four years later. And I found myself in a position where I could again take some time off. And I was like, this is great. I've got like young teenage girls, which the that early teen years is when they really need you. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna take a year. I'm gonna cash out. I got all this, you know, we sold the company. This is great. And um and two weeks later I threw my back out because that always happens if you're a working human being yeah. of any kind, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a working mom, the minute you rest, uh -huh. right, get sick or get hurt. Like that's the law. Yeah. The law of motherhood. The way it works. <laughs> so I threw my back out. I couldn't move. I I wasn't even doing anything. I'm the least athletic person. I literally sat up in bed, turned to say something to Elle, and couldn't turn back. And um and it was three weeks. I was down. Like I tried every drugstore product. I went to the orthopedist. He gave me a cortisone shot. Gave me Percocet. I was mm. high for like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing worked. And so finally he said, uh, my boyfriend was like, oh, I have this buddy who has this product that all the pro athletes use for pain. Why don't we just put it on your back? Like you've tried everything. Why not try? Yeah. yeah I couldn't even move. I was like, okay, I'm like laying down. I can't move. And, um, and he puts it on my back and within minutes I could move, I could move my shoulders. My, it was, I was like deep under my scapula and I could like move my shoulders. I could get out of bed. I was like, this is a miracle. What is this product? Like, what is in this? Yeah. And he's like, it's called Flex Power. And it had this like crappy packaging. And I was like, well, where can I buy it? And he's like, you can't buy it. So they only sell it to pro athletes. They sell through the distributor channel. So you, I, I can get you more. Like he was an investor in the company. So I was like, I'm sure I can get you more, but you can't buy it. I was like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> like, that's stupid. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so I was like, I need to meet this buddy of yours. And I'm going to uh -huh. convince him that he needs to make this a consumer product. And so I met Rasheen Smith, who's the founder. He came for dinner and, and he told me his, his story is amazing. He's not a mom, but you guys, his story is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he had been an NCAA basketball player and he, he went to Cal, right? Went to Cal. And yeah. he- We'll um, forgive him for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, everyone has one flaw. So. Exactly. Yeah. He's otherwise a great guy. Um, <laughs> and he, um, he noticed that on the court, if you're wearing like an Icy Hot or Tiger Bomb or any of these other things with menthol, the opposing team could smell your injury. And so they would go <laughs> after you physically wherever they could smell your injury. So everyone on the, on his team, they started, he's, you know, this is 20 years ago. They had like bowls of painkillers in the locker room because yeah. this is before we knew what we know today about pain. Mm -hmm. So everyone's taking painkillers and he thought, you know, that's going to be what I do. I'm going to create something that doesn't smell, that isn't full of chemicals, that topically will solve these problems. So my buddies don't have to put poison into their bodies to wow. feel better. And he created Flex Power. And it, it was sold. It wasn't widely sold. I mean, it was sold through these distributor channels. Um, a bunch of pro teams used it. A bunch of colleges used it. The USA Olympic teams were using it. Um, and the and the business was just sort of flat. And um, and his, you know, his main investor was like, you know, you really need to figure out how to grow this. Like I've invested, let's figure it out. And I just happened to meet him around that time. And so when I met him and I said, you could make this a consumer product. And I was coming off of Westfield where I had access to all the retail numbers. So I'm like, I can tell you health and wellness is on fire. Like these mm -hmm. businesses are booming. And if you go to these, you know, these boutique fitness, the gyms or the Equinox or Soul Cycle or Barry's Boot Camp or all the, like everyone is there, right? This is where you need to be. And people will buy this product. Your product's amazing, but you have to rebrand it. It looks like crap. And um, <laughs> he was like, okay. That's Cal. That's because all right. Let's bring in a Stanford mind. <laughs> Sorry. So, Let's bring in a Stanford mind here. I was like, okay, Rich, now we have the brand. So now you need a website and we need the contacts and we need this and we're going to get you out there. And he was like, I don't know how to do this. Could you just be the CEO and, and do this for me? So my year <laughs> off wasn't really a year off. Yeah. yeah. Nice year I, off. I accidentally found my way here, but it was per it was perfect trajectory because yeah. I kind of aged out of fashion. I then gotten to see all of retail at Westfield. So I had a mm -hmm. handle on what was going on in the landscape. I was excited about the health and wellness category. I was pushing 50. So I was ready to be like, I want to do something in this space that's going to help me and my friends and everyone I know feel good. Um, and um, 
it, it was like, it was just a great time and a great synergy. And Rasheen and I just get on so well. And so he's like, I'll work on the product development and working with all the teams and stuff, but you have to do everything else. So we did, and we launched, and two weeks after we launched, COVID shut the world down. So the vision of getting in front of all these places never materialized because they were all shut down. So we doubled down and, and worked on product development. That's when we invented Soothe, which is my absolute favorite product. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. we've been working on for about three years. It's an Arnica-based product. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's amazing for pain relief, for putting on your feet before you're wearing height. That's what I was going to say. Can we like really tease yeah. out? Because I don't think I realized when I first was introduced to Flexfire, I thought it was like, okay, I have an ache or I have a sore muscle. I'm going to yeah. put it there. And it, it did work. Oh my God. It worked in, like but instantly too, which is crazy. It's, yeah. it's amazing how much, and I put it, now I put it on before I go to bed when I've got something that's sore and it's, but it's like arthritis. Right. Yeah. So the warm, that's our warm, the original is an over the counter product. It's powered by glucosamine, but it, we can't say it's a hundred percent natural because there are some chemical ingredients, although they're all like botanically sourced. Um, but that product is amazing for deep pain. It's great for arthritis. In fact, that, you know, a lot of the NBA players, their moms were taking it for their arthritis, you know? And so that was, that's where our order. My mom has was. horrible arthritis and I cannot wait. Once I heard that in your, when I, when I was listening to your interview the other day, I'm like, yeah. I cannot wait to get this in her hands. It works incredibly well. And warm is great for that. Glucosamine is proven um, and we can make that FDA claim. Glucosamine is proven to help with arthritis, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's it does. I told, I've, I've taken it orally before and I gave it to my mom as well. And she's yeah. like, after a week of taking it orally, she felt way better. She swims. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. Day. It's an, yeah. it's amazing. And then our, the Arnica based product is really good for basically all pain. I mean, Arnica is known as a homeopathic you know, tool for everything from, you know, preventing bruises. If you've ever had surgery or something, they'll give mm -hmm. you Arnica oral yeah. to prevent bruising. Um, but it relieves pain. We, we threw some CBD in that formula. So it tingles and it tells your brain, like, this is really good what's happening. Um, and it's got like turmeric and echinacea and all these amazing natural ingredients in it. And, you know, we put it out there as a scent free pain relief lotion, but then we had customers telling us all these crazy things that they've used it for. So <laughs> We had um, someone who was in the Caribbean who put it on like the worst mosquito bites ever. And she said, you know, it made them stop itching and it healed them in a day. So wow. I personally tried that this summer. It totally worked. It was amazing. Um, we, I had a friend who had a jellyfish sting. He put it on and because of the Arnica, it like healed his skin as well as took the pain away, which was wow. Cool. And no one had to piss on him, I assume. I know. So <laughs> don't think we have that conversation, all of us. We were like, yeah, and I'm like, I have Soothe, you guys. Why don't you put Soothe on Let's it? try that first. <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot easier. A lot easier. It was It was his entire <laughs> chest. It would have been a really oh. gruesome. gruesome <laughs> that would have been tough. To yeah. So, and then, you know, I had experimented early on with putting it on the balls of my feet because when I have to wear high heels, especially I used to wear four inch heels every day of my life until COVID. And no wonder your back went out like years later. I know. Right. Yeah. Seriously. Um, and so, and so, yeah, it works on your balls at your feet. If you have to wear heels, we had one guy on our team says he puts it here for under eye circles. Cause it works on no way. Ooh, I'm no way. I'm I was like, I was like, I don't think as a company we can make that claim. So I'm just hearing the information that someone, <laughs> okay. told me. someone did use that. I'm yeah, not trying someone to. has used it. Wait, for so I would use soothe for that. Not warm. Soothe, that's do not warm. warm on your hand would be, yeah. Warm well, be do you yeah. remember what happened at the Super Bowl, Lisa? So this is, I'm putting warm on Lisa's back when we're at, it's like the night of the media day and we're, you know, on our feet all day long. We're doing all this stuff and we're in this like unbelievable, it's, it's media day. So there's just people everywhere, thousands of people everywhere. And I'm putting, I am putting flex power on Lisa's back, like not just for it so that we can post about it and say, yeah. Hey, thanks for our sponsors. For real. Because Lisa was like, I am in so much pain. Well, right after that, I went to go put on like to update oh, yeah. my makeup. <gasps> And I literally was like, uh, I can't. Oh, I, everything's yeah. burning. Everything's burning. Now it went away very quickly, but that is exactly never right. looked better. smooth and the warm. You yeah. look the best you've ever looked though. I will say that. <laughs> so it did. on the back of the tube, we put wash your hands in. Place. Yeah. Because also, mm -hmm. especially for gentlemen before they use yes. the restroom. Yes. See, this is the kind of real information that, yeah, this right. is great. I'm glad we can get in this. Extraordinarily uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, okay. And you have, the last thing I want to say is that you have a new product that we actually got a chance to try. It is your lip conditioner. Yeah. Flex Balm. And I use so many different like lip conditioning products and I, I'm not kidding you. I am obsessed. 
I am literally obsessed with this. I love it. What is it? It is. So it's, it's all natural. So it's got, you know, like jojoba oil and shea butter and like rosemary and peppermint gives it the tingle. There's no menthol. There's no chemicals in it. It's all natural ingredients. Um, and it's actually ingredients that are going to get into your lips and heal them. And as a result, this was not the intention when we made it, but it plumps your lips a little bit because it's filling in the cracks and it's healing. Ooh, so done. it's, it's yeah. not meant I'm to lip plumper, but it actually will do that. But it, and at the same time, it's unisex. Like there's all the, yeah. there's a bunch of athletes. I never realized how chapped athletes lips get. I mean, Lisa, I guess you would know this. Yeah. And every, so every time my kids come home here, cause we're in high altitude there, yeah. that's the first thing they do. They go and buy, buy medicated chapstick, but yeah. I have them hooked on this now. Yeah. So. And so yeah, we have a, a version with sunscreen that we're going to launch later, eventually when we launch our sun collection, which is coming up later this year. Amazing. But, um, but I'm really proud of this because I also find that Gen Z is more obsessed with lip products than any group of yes. people I've ever met. I 100%. Yes, they are. I can attest to that. My, they are obsessed with obsessed. it. So, and I have all boys. Yes. Which is crazy that even boys yeah. are obsessed. But right. it's Whatever. the thing. Like we, I have a bunch of young people who work for me and they all tried it. And they were te- they were like, well, kind of, it's, it's like Laneige, but it's better than Dior, but it's better. And I was like, how do you even know all these lip products? Like, <laughs> But they it's care. the best thing I've ever put on my lips. Right. I'm not even exaggerating. I'm, I'm not so saying glad. that just because you're on this call. Yeah, no, it's it's incredible. And we That's should say Mother's Day kit. It, uh, yes, okay. thank you. I don't want to belabor the point. Yeah. Just hey, uh, FYI, if you've started to fall asleep here, wake up. Mother's Day mm-hmm. is coming yes. very <laughs> soon, less than a month away, May 14th officially this year. And Flex, but you guys have an awesome Mother's Day package. I was just looking on your website. Q. Yeah, it's our Soothe Lotion, which we were just talking about, which solves yep. everything. Um, and then mm-hmm. our um, bath salts that we did with okay. our and those, I'm obsessed with those because I, I love a good bath. It'll read my book and I come out and I feel so good after you. I love them. I'm I so glad. Love them. And again, that's because we have Arnica in there, right? So most yes. bath salts are just the Epsom salt or sea salt, which is great. But then you get out of the bath and you're like, oh, but I felt so good 10 minutes ago. The right. Arnica kind of lets the healing stretch okay. on. And then we have vitamin E right. oil, which is good for your skin. So it doesn't dry your skin out. Because so, the Epsom salt will dry my skin out like crazy. It used exactly. to dry it out. And so the vitamin E oil keeps that from happening. And again, that was created by need, right? Like I was taking baths every day because I had a hip injury and I was hiding from my kids. I'm not gonna lie. It was COVID. It was rough. <laughs> um, but they, was like, they don't this, listen to your mom. It's fine. This is very <laughs> unsatisfactory experience how can we make something better and again i'm like i can make something better like why not so um we created our bath salt so that's in the mother's day package with the lip balm with the soothe and gift wrapping and it's all um we're selling it all at a gift price on the website flexpower.com is the website and you guys are so awesome and such great partners you actually are gonna we're gonna get all of the moms that we are interviewing during the month of may are going to get the Flex Power Mother's Day package, yes. which just thank you from the bottom of my heart for that because um, we've got some really great guests coming who are going to love it. And it is the ultimate. I mean, even when I first got this in the mail, I was like, it's beautiful package. I mean, of course it is because you're running the marketing, but I'm looking yeah. at, I'm like, the packaging makes you feel really good. Fun. Like this is, I, it's, that sounds so weird to say, but it just, you guys have a great thing and I'm glad it used to yeah. be sort of an undercover product. And I, I'm grateful that it, the world sort of led you to flex power and now you're helping it get into the hands of a lot of people who I know that it's, it's helping a lot. And I am certainly on that list. So we just want to wake up and feel good. Right. So yeah, absolutely. We're designing the products. You can do that. I'm, I'm excited that I can wear high heels again because I kind of have boycotted those for a while. But now that I know that I can put flex power on, let it dry, and then you rock those. Yeah, let it dry first because otherwise you'll be slipping around in your shoes. But if you like yeah. put it on, then go put your makeup on, come back, put your heels on. It'll save your night. I promise you. Finally, you'll look good again, Ashley. Like. <laughs> Yeah, we're a mess, Ashley. No, it's, really, it's the heels that were was lacking. So. That's been the problem. Yep. That has been That's the thing holding me back. Yep. <laughs> oh, Heather Vandenberg, you are you are amazing. I can't thank uh, you enough for amazing. being so generous with your time. I know how much you have going on in your life. Thank you for covering out an hour of your day. Yep. Um, well, I mean, and thank you for how to make a, a ponytail is actually I, I'm gonna, gonna send you I'm gonna help you with that, that, that product. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, if I can't put a ponytail right in a family of girls with long hair, what I mean, what good am I as a mom? You need me to fly out because I'm a big ponytail. Well. <laughs> at least, at least your daughter allows you to brush your hair. I'm at the point yeah. where I'm like, oh yeah, okay. How many M and M's is too many M and M's? Like feels like I can still say, say yes. Videos, you can have this, and I'm going to brush your hair. I've seen videos of Cora at dance, and she's like doing dance beautifully, but then she'll have to do her hair because her mom doesn't put her hair. Yeah, it's always it's literally it's like yeah. this. It's always and it's just yeah. So, My mom's always like, can you just, can you try a barrette? I'm like, I have tried all the things. So it's, the struggle is real. All we know things. it. That Flex Power's got to come out with something for that too. Yeah. Like, hair you know, something on your scalp. I like Rasheen. I know this is unfamiliar, but I need you to do something <laughs> the ponytails. Hear me out. I'm just brainstorming <laughs> here. Listen, listen. Uh, Heather, and I, and like I said at the top, we will forever be grateful no matter where this podcast go, where this show's go you were the first company that believed in us in a meaningful way. And yes. I, I just did from the bottom of our heart, like, thank you. Oh, we're happy um, to do it. We love you. you and we appreciate you. Amazing. What you're doing is amazing. And I think celebrating moms and everything that we all do to get these humans up to the level of, you know, the best people they can be. Mm -hmm. I love that you're celebrating that every day, not just on mother's day. So I love what you're doing. Well, thank you. And we're going to link to all the products in, yeah. in our, in our, in the and show notes. Finish so be your sure to book. Check it out. I want to read it. Finish. Your well, book. and I was just going to say, let's help you get that book and that movie like that. Let's put that. We usually manifest stuff at the end of this podcast. Yes. I'm manifesting that, that we are going to get you a book oh, and you. a movie. Well, eventually, it's, it's, yeah. Your story's not done yet, but it's but not done. Yeah. Frankly, like, I don't want to be a lifetime movie. I want to be a Hallmark movie. I want that happy ending. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love, love it. it. I love it. So. All right. Heather, thank you for your time. We we appreciate you. It's been great being Bye. with you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.